So let me start. Um, <laughs> good morning, Vancouver. Um, with four minutes left before I, I, I can still wish you a good morning. Uh, I will. Uh, so so basically, uh, I will I will come to uh, why you are listening to me. But before that. Uh, your question about how I came up with this. Um, a few months back, I was talking to uh, a technical co-founder uh, of a company who are uh, who are quite a bit into into open source. Uh, and um, the discussion, the point of discussion was that they are, they are about to embark into moving everything into. Um, I shouldn't say moving everything. So this is a digital native company. They have already been building on cloud, but they were really looking to sort of re-architect uh, for the future as they were at the growth stage. And the, and the main topic of discussion was how should, how should they continue to re retain all the benefits of open source while also take advantage of uh, what the cloud was offering to them. And uh, through this discussion, uh, and as we actually discussed, that's when the, the idea of this talk came to me. That okay, if we if we actually look at the evolution of how the open source and the open data ecosystem has happened over the years, that actually gives us some valuable information that we can actually take when we try and decide that how our future architecture should look like. <coughs> so that's where uh, the the main motivation of this talk came from. Uh, so personally, about me, why you should be sitting here listening to me. Uh, I'm Ranadip Chatterjee, as you can see there. Uh, I, uh, I work as a data analytics specialist within Google Cloud. Uh, in the, in the, uh, I'm, I'm based out of London. And uh, while I sort of travel across EMEA most, uh, more often, uh, but my main focus area is the UK and Ireland market. And, uh, and uh, we are quite fortunate to have uh, reasonably vibrant digital native and startup ecosystem in in London which uh, helps me get a good view of what uh, these companies are thinking of <coughs> so a bit about a little bit about me and why uh, how I am linked to uh, the uh, all of this open source um, thing is in back in 2009 I was working as a, a software engineer in Yahoo and that was about the time when Hadoop was being developed within Yahoo. And it was just coming out of Yahoo Labs and into the Yahoo's uh, production uh, environment. And I was in a product team who were the, one of the first teams to be actually building on top of the Hadoop platform back in 2009 when the world still didn't know that much about Hadoop. It was mainly around in the companies like Yahoo, LinkedIn, and Twitter, a few companies that knew about it. Uh, of course, uh, Google as well. Now, uh, 2012 onwards, for the next six years, I was working mo uh, on a personal capacity as a, as a consultant, uh, working with a few of the very big enterprises in UK, uh, building their clusters and helping them onto their journey onto uh, the, the Hadoop ecosystem. So mainly around that was around Apache Spark or Apache Hadoop and these, you know, these sort of systems. <coughs> Back in 2018, uh, and just 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 before I proceed any further, I'm having a bit of a bad throat today, which is why I chose to take the hand mic. Uh, so if my throat misbehaves, I can quickly spare you the pain and just move it away. So uh, please ex excuse me uh, if I'm not sounding uh, right always. <coughs> so back in 2018, I joined uh, Google Cloud. And, uh, and that's when I started sort of appreciating or understanding from the inside of what the cloud was really providing us. And uh, over the last few years, so 2020 onwards, I've been mainly focusing on digital natives. Uh, so which gives me a wide sort of a view of the enterprise world, the digital native world, and what really matters to them and how the open source uh, systems have been evolving alongside the cloud and that's that's uh, uh, and from this experience um, what you will be seeing today or hearing today is more of my experiences and the lessons that i have learned out of uh, out of the last 10 12 years so that's the agenda um, uh, we will go through an introduction and then cover the early evolution of uh, open source big data analytics then uh, as part of the challenges of the changing world this is where we will uh, look at what the digital natives think of uh, what happened before or whether they really care. Uh, and then we will briefly go through the cloud journey because interestingly enough, as the open source uh, data analytics e uh, ecosystem was developing, the cloud also developed around the same time. Uh, I would say somewhat in parallel, but there were a lot of crossovers as well. So today uh, the cloud is everywhere. So it is important to understand how the two interact. And, uh, and finally, we'll end with the key takeaways uh, from these two. 
<coughs> so um, looking back at the history, um, uh, so wh why is this important? Why, should, why, why do we even care about what happened, say, 20 years back? Uh, and the reason why uh, I thought it will be good to understand is uh, there were, uh, there was, um, I mean, there were a good few reasons why uh, Hadoop became as big of a thing as it did. And if we understand why, then that helps us in uh, to, uh, to sort of design for the future so that we can be aware of the pitfalls that we might fall into. So um, here I've taken a graph from the Google Trends, uh, basically the search trends. And uh, really, this is, this is a proxy. Uh, by no means is this an absolute uh, data. But what, we, uh, what I wanted to show here is um, the popularity in terms of search results uh, for the various different terms. And as, as a proxy of how popular these technologies are um, uh, in, 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 in the common like, developer community. So uh, a few interesting facts here. Um, so late 90s, early 2000s, that is when open source itself was get getting quite popular. Uh, we, uh, mostly we, uh, who, um, most of us who are uh, aware of the open source world, we know that Linux has played a very big role in that. And, and Red Hat in particular also played a huge role in sort of making uh, open source mainstream amongst the enterprises. Uh, and this was happening in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then um, uh, uh, around 2004 is when Google published the MapReduce uh, paper. And that gave rise to uh, a few attempts to uh, sort of move into uh, a mo move into the data analytics space, uh, um, uh, uh, where we can sort of uh, really make industry quality data analytics uh, products uh, using open source. So um, Hadoop came out of this roughly around 2006, 2007 time. Uh, um, and then it was shortly followed by a number of other systems. So we had Apache Storm. Uh, Cassandra, HBase, Flume, Samsa, a number of different systems which came out of different companies uh, uh, around this time. Uh, and also, it was shortly followed by Apache Spark, which is quite ubiquitous today. Um, but uh, for the initial good few years, Spark really didn't spark that much of an interest in people. Um, and it was, it was, uh, so my belief is it was the integration with the Hadoop and the HDFS ecosystem that really uh, led to Spark taking off as the big thing. <laughs> and, uh, and some of this we can actually see here. Uh, now, interestingly enough, I have picked up Databricks as one of the, uh, uh, one of the outliers here. And the, the, there is nothing specific uh, about Databricks, but Databricks is one of the companies who have built a business out of uh, open source, um, even though like we can't say that yeah everything that is coming out of Databricks is open source, but one of the companies that have really built their business on uh, uh, on uh, Apache Spark. And the interesting fact here is that while we can see that roughly the trend of Apache Spark is stable, maybe with a slight downward trend, but Databricks is having a very strong upward trend. And <laughs> this is this is where we'll actually come back to uh, the benefits of how cloud. So, so Databricks is one of the companies which are, I would say, they're quite uh, digital native in the in terms of uh, providing their uh, product on top of the clouds. And uh, this is where the uh, crossover between the cloud services and open source can be exemplified. Now. Um, no specific reason why um, I picked up these these four um, products. The reason, the, the 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 key reason is before the advent of uh, Hadoop and popularity of Hadoop, uh, these four products were mainly uh, um, sort of standing in as the systems that were catering to the use cases that Hadoop was catering to later on. So <laughs> the main reason here is all of these products are very good products, no doubt about it. But the purpose of this, again, this is search trends, so this does not talk anything about the quality of the products or anything. But this does show that from the search point of view, the popularity of these products have gone down over the same period uh, uh, when the popularity of uh, the open source data analytics products have gone up. So what uh, we will actually go into what 
was happening here. So uh, let's look at what led to uh, what led to Hadoop being so popular. So let's put some con context there. That what was happening in early two thousands. Uh, so this was a time when um, there were three to four decades of dominance of the major uh, major database players who were also providing the data analytics uh, uh, systems. So data the data analyt uh, analytical databases and analytical systems. Um, <clears throat> data analytics itself was emerging out as a separate stream away from the uh, the online transactional systems or the uh, or, or the relational databases uh, this was also a period of time when the disk prices were going down and companies were actually able to um, store a lot more data in a cost efficient manner so suddenly they did not have to throw away all that data and uh, the other thing in context is this is just after the internet boom so there was a lot of user data that was getting generated around this time and uh, and while previously um, it was it was uh, quite a bit challenging as well as expensive to store all of this data because of the commercial reasons. Uh, that was no more a big big deal. <clears throat> but there was another thing that all of this data that was getting generated was not quite in the form that the uh, existing database databases liked. So there was also a, a long um, chain of uh, transformations that needed to be done in order to really uh, get this data into the into those data systems so roughly this was uh, this was the context let's look at what were the problems uh, that uh, the industry was facing around this time <coughs> so uh, extortionate usage fees so extortionate i put that in double quotes um, because uh, Extortion is, of course, a perception. Uh, um, different companies can think of different different ways of it. But the one, there was one key thing, as we saw, that there were a handful of vendors who were really um, providing the uh, products which were even closely capable of handling the analytical workloads. And, uh, and for the customers of these products, there was no other alternative to go to. So whatever was the fees, whether that was high or not, they didn't really have much of an alternative. So the feeling, the, the feeling of not having the freedom for an alternative is what gave rise to uh, the feeling that there was an extortionate amount of fees. Whether um, open source really reduced or completely did away with all that, that's, uh, that's debatable. But at least that was the feeling in those days. High hardware cost was definitely a fact because most of these analytical systems uh, had a uh, very monolithic uh, structure and needed very high spec machines to uh, to be working on. And quite often they would actually need specific machines from specific uh, hardware vendors uh, to run. And, and these were um, usually quite expensive. Uh, scalability was another issue um, uh, because, again, because of the monolithic structure, there were physical limits to so how much it can scale, uh, how many CPUs you can actually put into um, to put into these machines, and hence how much compute you can actually get out of it. Um, high migration cost. So again, I think this is down to the fact that most of these systems were um, uh, proprietary systems. So if if a company had to move from one to the other, then there was a lot of migration involved in both data as well as the workloads on top of it. Uh, business continuity, disaster recovery, high availability, each of these were quite, quite complex. So for the enterprise uh, world, they, they had to design in complex architectures to take care of this. And finally, integration nightmares. So um, there were some, there were uh, some attempts to um, standardize in terms of uh, JDBC and uh, SQL compliance and all that. But still, there was a lot of proprietary um, uh, details in there. So in practice, uh, integration between different systems, unless you are within the closed ecosystem of these vendors, was uh, uh, was a big problem. So how did, how did the open source uh, movement help? So uh, one of the things that Hadoop was built on, and I think that was one of the best things uh, to have happened in the industry, was on four major principles. The first was it was open source. So even before Hadoop was an Apache product, uh, uh, it, it was still an open source uh, product within Yahoo. Uh, it was built with the principle uh, to run on low cost commodity hardware. Um, 
it was built designed for horizontal scalability without any technical limitations to how much it can scale and finally it was designed to be fault tolerant in itself so these four uh, and the significance of it was hadoop being the very first system uh, um, to have been built on these set the benchmark quite high for every other system to come and we know that since then whatever the new systems both in streaming or batch or whatever the analytical systems have come these four have become the pillars based on which every other system has been built so let's look at how uh, these uh, these uh, principles or these four key features um, uh, led to alleviating some of these issues. So extortion fees. So certainly because it, uh, uh, Hadoop is open source, there was freedom. And freedom means customers had a choice. So having a choice immediately um, gives you the perception that uh, you can actually get things done in your own ways. Uh, and this, this uh, immediately uh, alleviated the, that feeling of getting bound into a particular ecosystem and getting locked in, uh, as we say. Um, high hardware cost, um, yes, uh, because of uh, the ability to run on commodity hardware, uh, there was no need to buy very high-end machines, and uh, we could pretty easily run it on. Uh, I know that there had been even some attempts to run Hadoop on um, Raspberry Pis. Uh, which did run uh, at least. So yeah, I mean the point here is that you can run it on any size machine as you please um, uh, to suit your budget. And uh, and finally, it was massively scalable. There is no doubt about it that there was no technical limitations. The limitations used usually <coughs> would be in the form of the size of a um, the size of the data center itself. Or maybe uh, one of the limitations quite often was the network bandwidth, which yes, uh, which uh, which was a hardware uh, limitation again. Um, so, but in general, the software would actually scale quite seamlessly. Now, for some of the other issues, I would say my view is that uh, Hadoop was only able to partially address some of these. So, high migration cost. Um, there, so Hadoop came with some open formats, file formats, which allowed customers to directly migrate uh, uh, files from one platform to another, um, and hence alleviated some of the high migration cost. Having said that, my view is that there is still significant effort in migrating uh, even open source systems. So, I wouldn't uh, say that we completely um, have solved that problem. Next, the uh, business continuity, disaster recovery, and fault tol tolerance is another thing. So high availability is one thing that has been resolved due to the fault tolerant uh, nature of Hadoop. Um, at least at a local level, we don't need to be, we don't need to think of uh, high availability. Uh, however, business continuity and disaster recovery is still, uh, there, there are still challenges that we need to uh, consider. Uh, and finally, integration nightmares. Yes, integration is still an issue, um, probably less so than before. Um, probably some might actually argue that it may not be the case. Uh, I would say there are some, like uh, the, the ecosystem of uh, uh, different products that interact with Hadoop has increased over, uh, over the years. And this gives rise to a larger uh, ecosystem to choose from and hence probably in my view, we have uh, reduced those integration nightmares to an extent. <coughs> so challenges of the new order. So what's the new order? The new order by new order, I mean the digital natives. So we spoke about the, the, the issues that uh, data warehouses, the like traditional data warehouses had before. But then there was this bunch of companies, which, uh, uh, as we call them, the digital native or the cloud native, who were not even aware of these issues because they were born in an age where uh, Hadoop was really the standard. So what did they realize when they came in? Uh, <coughs> what they saw from their, their eyes was here is a very inefficient system that we are dealing with. A Hadoop cluster takes a lot of effort, a lot of engineering resources, very expensive engineering resources to actually uh, design and build the cluster. They need continuous uh, employment of uh, uh, expensive engineering resources to manage and maintain the underlying infrastructure. Uh, there was a time uh, when uh, Hadoop ops roles, the people who used to actually like manage clusters or build clusters, they were the highest paid uh, people in that uh, ecosystem of developers working within the 
Hadoop roles. And after all that is done, then came the actual application, the business application developers who would actually um, develop on that. So there was a huge uh, cost associated with managing and maintaining own Hadoop clusters, uh, and then um, some value on top of it. Next, um, continuing with the inefficiencies or the pains, uh, scaling pains. So yeah, uh, Hadoop was horizontally scalable. Technically, yes. In practice, what happened was there was weeks to months of delay when development teams needed to scale up because they had to wait for budget to be approved for procurement of new hardware. And then the new hardware has to go through its own procurement process. Then you need security clearances and then deployment of those hardware into the data center before the actual scaling can happen, which depending on the size of companies can actually take weeks to months. So in practice, uh, it was quite slow and painful scaling up. <laughs> Utilization pains were there, yeah, uh, because in in key, in the case of uh, self-managed Hadoop clusters, when designing a cluster, you have to do a capacity planning, and you would either do a capacity planning uh, based on uh, an optimistic uh, view of how fast the company will be growing, and hence over provision. Or you might see that you have actually provisioned a cluster, but the, but the business is growing much faster than that, and hence, uh, very quickly, the utilization goes very high, and then um, systems slow down. So uh, utilization was either very high or very low. It was never quite right. Uh, finally, uh, it came with a high upfront cost because all of that hardware, all of that uh, the, the, the data center real estate, they needed to be paid for. Uh, and uh, hardware upgrades were also painful. So if there is a, uh, if there's a new class of CPU or a new class of GPU that has come, it's difficult to actually get that because maybe just a couple of years back, you have procured a, a set of new hardware and that's still getting amortized and you don't want to just throw that, and throw that off. So these were uh, <laughs> some of the, uh, yeah, and then at the software level, there were inefficiencies. Um, they, uh, even though there was this big ecosystem of uh, software that actually interoperates with one another in the Hadoop world, each of these are different projects having their own different plans. So effectively, at a software level, we had library mismatches, version mismatches, what we call as the dependency hell to deal with. We had API incompatibilities be between different versions, um, and, and then there would be performance issues uh, coming up because of all these. So <coughs> this, these are, the, these are the, all the pain, uh, pain points that, were, uh, uh, that the digital natives were actually seeing in uh, what was a huge relief from the previous, uh, uh, previous world. Now, it's important to actually, as I said, understand the cloud as well, because uh, very close to um, as the, the Hadoop ecosystem or the open source, uh, the open source data, eco uh, data analytic systems were developing, cloud was also developing. So back in like 2006, I think Amazon uh, released their, um, uh, the first cloud product, uh, which was then after a few years, um, followed by Microsoft and Google. So, um, Today, of course, cloud is the first choice, and hence it's important to actually understand that how uh, was uh, how did the cloud develop, and how we can then uh, join the two to figure out that what's the best way forward. So the very first version of uh, cloud was focused on infrastructure, uh, basically built on the economics of scale, uh, bringing a large number of use cases together, um, and hence building large clusters and distributing the cost across. Uh, freedom, the key advantages were, of course, freedom from data center management for the end customers, uh, moving ownership to, uh, uh, like from an ownership model to a tenancy model, so you don't own that anymore. So what that means is that first of all, your capital expenses go away. Uh, you don't have to have a high investment to start with. Uh, and secondly, when you want to upgrade, that's an easy process. You don't have to think of like previous sunk cost and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, this uh, this also resulted in sh uh, shorter turn turnaround times for upgrades or or scalability uh, or scaling clusters. <laughs> the next was uh, we have the cloud 2.x, so the next generation of cloud where, where uh, we saw that uh, apart from just infrastructure, 
Um, we saw the evolution into databases, web servers, um, clusters, even fully managed clusters uh, uh, evolving. Um, so this gave rise to a few more advantages as uh, like uh, we immediately saw better utilization of infrastructure, models like pay as you use um, uh, came into existence uh, and infra upgrades and all of these things were no more required because the cloud provider would do that. Uh, so we could just provision a database and just go uh, go on with it. Some some examples would actually be uh, products like BigQuery, Dataproc, or Redshift would be uh, some of the uh, examples of these uh, these products. Uh, and then we had the Cloud 3.x, or uh, I would say this is this is where we probably are right now. Um, uh, and still sort of maturing. We are, I, I, I wouldn't say we have done this yet fully, uh, still in the process. And this is the, this is the age of the software as a service or SaaS, uh, which is mainly focused on the business needs. So can we actually come up with fully managed business uh, solutions instead of building blocks for business solutions? So these are like serverless. We don't see server. We don't see infrastructure. We don't see any any uh, software behind it. Uh, there is no operations, uh, and we pay by use. So again, uh, here um, we completely do away with anything to do with owning uh, owning the software itself. We just pay a particular subscription charge and use it. Examples would be Salesforce, HubSpot. Um, uh, Looker in the BI space or Slack in the chat and monitoring space, these sort of products. <coughs> and finally, what was also um, uh, developing around these, um, all through this, uh, the standard op open data standards. So while, um, so what one thing that we saw that there was uh, a big support, I would say, from the cloud providers in sort of uh, uh, developing some of these uh, data data standards as well. So we had uh, like Parquet or Capro, these were some of the formats that had existed in the Hadoop world, uh, which uh, in the cloud world were actually well adopted as well. Um, more recently, we saw the development of uh, open table formats, uh, so Iceberg, Hoodie, Delta. So that itself gave us uh, a big uh, shift in terms of uh, not being uh, tied down to uh, specific data warehouses for uh, uh, for uh, performance or feature benefits and sort of standardizing those away into into um, the the storage format itself. And then we had the uh, standardized uh, information exchange protocols like the Avro Wire protocol, uh, protocol buffers, so uh, some of the popular ones. Uh, and finally, we had the domain-specific data schemas, uh, which are getting, uh, so this is, this is still in evolution, I would say. Uh, things like, say, the FIRE protocol for uh, health data uh, exchange, the open banking APIs for um, this is this is uh, I don't know if you're aware of the open banking APIs. This is quite big in uh, Europe, um, which has sort of revolutionized the banking industry um, with the advent of a large number of like new banks now. <laughs> Similarly, we have the the NASA open open APIs, which have been recently. Um, uh, I don't know whether it's recently or not, but NASA has published these APIs as standardized formats for uh, space and Earth observation. So these uh, standardized open formats are uh, also developing. <laughs> so with this context, um, how can we actually get? Like with all of this knowledge, how can we actually bring them together uh, and look at how to develop for the future? So this is one of the things that personally I think, um, and this is, I, I would say uh, at a personal level that this is my um, key learning in the last few years based on my uh, previous learning from my work in the open source world as well as currently working in the, you know, within a cloud service provider for a few years is we can actually, like, if you look at any um, software architecture, um, whether it's data analytics or not, we can always break it down into which bits are really, uh, I would say, the gold for the business, what's really useful for the business, that the business wants to protect what we can say as the digital intellectual property, 
and what's fluff for the business. So what, what are all that scaffolding bits that you need around it because the, that is required to run it. And if we can separate those things out and <coughs> then we can actually make use of this pyramid, the, 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 the actual value and cost uh, pyramid because I think the value is in protecting what's valuable for the business. And this is where we should be using everything that we have learned about the evolution of open source and what problems the open source in uh, the open source industry has solved for us. And for in the future, if you want to protect our uh, digital intellectual property, if you want to protect retention of value of from this, then we should continue to invest in ensuring that this value is retained in open standards so that uh, we are not overly reliant on a particular vendor uh, or on a particular technology. Now, everything else which is fluff, to be honest, we don't really care because what we, uh, what we really want is to run that top layer. So if there are cloud service providers or other service providers who can run on, uh, on the cloud wherever we are operating, if we can actually just um, get that at the most um, commercially best deal that we can get and do away with it, then that's all we care about. And to be honest, I don't think we should be investing a lot into um, doing them on open source or managing our own systems or whatever it is, because we don't, do, do we really care? And with that principle, I think this is, uh, so here is a few, here are a few ways that we can actually protect value. So I wouldn't really um, focus on the lower bits because that's probably one thing that yes, for the lower bits, I don't care. How do we, how can I protect value for the, for the top part of that pyramid? And, uh, and that's where I, uh, I would recommend using open formats, using open standards um, and, uh, and try and insulate um, away from deep dependencies into into any technology that does not uh, that is not open now this is this is <coughs> one area there I think there we are still evolving so uh, we can do the open formats open table formats apis and everything that we have spoken of one thing that we are still uh, uh, we are running a risk is uh, something called te technology lock-in and that's where uh, I don't think that we are still um, at a place where we can say that we are completely, uh, we can insulate ourselves. Um, <clears throat> and what do I mean by that? And if you refer back to the very first slide that I showed on the trends and how systems are developing, we can actually see that every technology has, has its time. It grows and then it uh, withers off. Uh, and uh, getting and being overly dependent on any specific technology does build in the, uh, mm, the risks of technology lock-in, which are not too dissimilar to vendor lock-in. Because if we, if we define lock-in as the cost of coming out of that particular system, then vendor lock-in and technology lock-in, we can look at both as the cost of coming uh, migrating away from that. And, and this is something that I personally feel that we are not quite yet there. Uh, even in the open source world, um, uh, there are technologies which where we can get entrenched into a particular technology build quite uh, widely on top of it. And as uh, that technology itself goes out of favor, we will be faced with a big challenge of migrating in onto something else. Now, how can we um, insulate against them? I think there are a few, um, like a few new uh, ways of like, few ways developing to address this and uh, we we are recently actually seeing the separation or the abstraction between the def definition of uh, of the uh, actual applications or defining what transformations you are um, uh, you want to do on the data or how, what sort of operations you want to do and actually the underlying engine that executes those operations and this abstraction I think is important in order to insulate us from the tech, tech, tech lock-in. Uh, as of now there are two examples that I can think of which are steps in the right direction. One is a project called Apache Beam. Uh, um, I don't know if you have come across this, which really separates out the definition um, definition from the execution. And hence it is possible to, um, with that approach, it is possible to have your definition, which is where your business logic will be sitting in. 
And if the underlying technology that executes that business logic does go out of favor, then it gives you the ability to move on to another new engine without having to do any migration simply because your um, the business logic is not hard coupled to the execution engine. Having said that, Apache Beam is a project that came uh, as a collaboration out of Google and the Flink community. Um, so Flink is uh, still the uh, has a very big um, support for it. But apart from that, there are, I think Apache Spark also does uh, support Beam, but a, a, as an execution engine. Uh, but it's still, the reason I'm saying that it's still in, in its early days is that adoption is still uh, quite low. Um, another um, another uh, technology or a, a, another feature in Spark that I recently came across is called Spark Connect that tries to abstract out um, the two layers to an extent. Uh, which I think could be, at least from the thinking point of view, I think it's a thought in the right direction. But this is one of the areas that I think we will still need to have more development within the community before we can say we have a solution to uh, the tech lock-in risk. So just to wrap up, um, what we learned or what, what we saw today, the open source analytics, uh, open source data analytics can be efficient or inefficient, uh, depending on the way we use it. We should be aware of the inefficiencies that it can bring. Cloud services can optimize cost, so we, we need not worry about the fluff. Um, and open, open data, open source, uh, everything within the open source community can actually help us uh, retain value and optimize value, and that's what we should be looking at for protecting the gold within our business. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, for questions, if you can please uh, take the microphone so that your question does get recorded. That'd be good. Thank you. So in the open source formats, what's kind of weird happening is there's the open source format like Delta, but then the vendors are pitching their managed offerings. And what's happening is the managed offerings are better than the open source ones because if you use Delta, there's like problems with like compaction and they're like, oh, if you use the managed version, you can do the same. And that seems to be the trend where all these open source formats have a managed vendor. And in my opinion, it doesn't seem like there's a true open source community in the data space because there is an incentive for the vendors to create and manage offering. I'm just curious on your perspective on this. Yeah, um, actually, that's a that's a very good point. Um, not something that um, um, I haven't noticed, and there is always open source. Um, uh, but but <laughs> so uh, I think we have actually seen this from companies that have built their businesses on open source because it's once you have an open source technology, how do you actually monetize that? And that has always been uh, an issue. So there, were, there was a time when we had companies like Hortonworks and Cloudera where the main monetization was based on the service so that they would build um, their technology on open source, but they will say that, okay, we will manage it for you and that's where the money comes from. But uh, we saw that um, the gradual evolution of that happened where these open source companies gradually built up a layer on top of it that was not open source where they would actually provide some more optimizations on, on top. And that is effectively finding out a way on how to actually survive. So I think that's the, that's the continuous friction or the tension you can actually see between um, open source being a, like open source being uh, something good for the technology of the developer community, for the technology community, but also trying to uh, um, trying to survive within a commercial ecosystem. How do you actually continue to do that? Uh, one thing that I would actually say is that uh, even like when we think of open source, um, there are different ways of open source. And again, personally, I, I think a, a, a real success of open source is a very good example is of Linux. So if you look at the contribution, uh, if you look at the contributor list of Linux, there is a very good wide range of contributors in Linux. However, if you look at many of the uh, common open source systems that we are seeing in the data analytics space, we see that a lot of this contribution comes from a few companies, and which means that there is still, even though the source is open, but the technology is still being controlled by uh, not a very wide community. And this is where typically the problem happens, is that uh, now because of this 
dependency on uh, commercial companies who have who are also struggling to sort of uh, return value to their own investors we are seeing this this sort of things to be honest there is no clear answer to yes what can we do about it apart from uh, uh, hopefully if the open source community grows larger and larger then you will see that these sort of things will actually and then a very good example is actually uh, generative ai so generative ai had been in the behind the closed doors for so many years now with open ai um, coming up with say, something like chat gpt and gpt4 suddenly all of these closed doors had to be opened up and which caused an immense leap in how uh, development is happening in the open and i think i think that is what will happen so what you are saying is right but i think we are seeing we are seeing, we are somewhere in the middle of that evolution uh, down uh, hopefully the best case scenario is that open source community will actually catch up with these these things i just wanted to give a completely selfish plug um, i'm the developer relations lead for the trino open source query engine which does support delta lake iceberg hoodie and Hive, and also all the various proprietary like and open source relational databases in Elasticsearch, and is a SQL query engine that's completely open source, and it's supported by multiple vendors, including Apple, Starburst, who I work for, but also Netflix and Bloomberg and many others used by places like Salesforce. And that is a, a f an open source alternative that aims to be that kind of a place that allows you to scale that. So I invite you all to try it out. Sure, thank you. Yes, thanks for your talk. So I have a question about um, open data sets for um, non-commercial usage, things like research, things like policy making, things like that are not traditionally research. Um, and you know, there's this real kind of somewhat of an oligopoly for a handful of cloud vendors uh, that kind of have the capacity to build and maintain these very large scale and sometimes global data sets. Um, how should one think about the kind of making these data sets more democratized and open and available and accessible, uh, you know, in terms of vendor policy or choice, choosing which vendor, you know, Amazon versus Google versus IBM versus Azure. There's all this sort of internal jockeying going on. Meanwhile, this data, these data sets are really important for uh, you know global access and free access to some degree. You know how how do you, how should one think about that kind of use case versus the commercial use case where you know there's a clear path to commercial benefit? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so. So here, uh, my perspective is uh, actually, yes, you are right, that uh, these sort of only very few companies actually have the resources to manage and maintain these uh, data sets. And we can even general generalize that to overall cloud service providers as well, because cloud service providing is a very resource, resource in, in intensive um, business. So we haven't actually seen many small companies uh, emerge out of uh, as cloud service providers for this very reason. I think um, the good thing, or at least as far as I can actually see that much of this data set is still uh, sort of being stored in an open format. So either uh, a lot of this data is either in maybe CSV formats or Parquet formats, like sort of open formats. Um, on, um, so like as far as, uh, as long as that's there, I think, um, uh, we do not run the risk that yes, this data set is getting locked in. Uh, to an extent, I have seen at least in the UK, uh, there has been push from the regulatory bodies and from the government bodies that any public data set has to be uh, in an interoperable format. Um, particularly in the healthcare space, which is not very well known for um, adopting um, open formats, uh, the, the, the country is making regulation that any, any new product or any new company they necessarily need to have an interoperability uh, strategy if they are to um, uh, if they are to be part of any government procurement. Uh, so there is uh, definitely a public support in terms of through through these regulatory bodies for that. That is definitely one um, one relief, I would say. Um, but we can't we can't shy away from the fact that yes, the requirements are so big that 
only apart from the few big commercial organizations or maybe a few uh, big universities only have the capability of doing that. And my personal view has been uh, data that's locked in the universities are even more difficult to actually get, get our hands on compared to those in the commercial space. Uh, and to that being part of a cloud provider, I can say that for much of that uh, public data sets that we have, there is a commercial model in how cloud providers can actually monetize or get a return on the money that they are spending and hosting this. Um, uh, and hence, I, I can actually see for the, at least for the foreseeable future, it sh we should be fine with that. Again, that's my view. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. I am aware that I'm five minutes over time. So uh, thanks for bearing with me and uh, have a lovely time in Vancouver. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>